The other day I was wondering what the temperature was really like on that uh, day in July, uh, July the 2nd, 1881, when the building was consecrated, um, given that uh, it probably didn't have electric fans even. So um, hopefully it was a pleasant day like it is outside today. Uh, and if, if it were beastly hot, well, you still got the building consecrated. So. And then I'm just wondering about that from a very human point of view, that how something like this church came to be. When you start to think about the history, it was 177 years ago, 177 years ago, that Bishop Philander Chase, the Bishop of Illinois, came out to Batavia, which was a village that was only nine years old at the time, and uh, gathered together a small group of Episcopalians and had the first service in this town. It took them 13 years to gather a critical mass, but then in 1855, in April of that year, they petitioned the Diocese of Illinois, as it was known at that time, to receive them as a congregation. And then they proceeded to build a church, which within a couple of years was destroyed in a storm, whether it was just uh, like a microburst or a tornado or just a bad, bad storm, we don't know, but it was destroyed. And they never rebuilt. They persevered as, as a small group and they would get together periodically when they knew they were going to have a priest coming from Geneva or from Aurora, from out in Sycamore or someplace to uh, gather them together. And so in rented space, they met. <coughs> and then came John Van Nortwick and the decision that he made that there needed to be a fitting house of worship for his Episcopal daughter or niece or whatever she was. Um, you can all correct my history later. But uh, that there would be this fitting place. And so that's how this building comes to be in this place here. And after it was in use for at least a year to a year and a half, and John Van Nortwick informed the bishop that he was going to give it to the diocese free and clear, the bishop came out and consecrated the church. A copy of the deed is on her, of deeding it over to the diocese, and the copy of the consecration uh, instrument is on the back wall there. It's reprinted in the bulletin for you. Uh, so on behalf of the entire Diocese of Illinois, as it was still known until a couple years later, um, this building was consecrated, set apart for the worship of God. And ever since, it's been in use. It's gone through many different things. Went through several wars. Not here, obviously, but it stood as a testimony to the faith of the congregation gathering here during the uh, during the uh, Spanish-American War, the First World War, the Second World War, the Korean War, the Vietnam War, the war against terror, continues to stand here as a reminder to the people around us and a reminder to ourselves that we are a holy people, we are the living stones that make up this temple of God, that we have been consecrated by our baptism and the gift of the Holy Spirit to be the holy people of God in this place as we go forward until God calls us to himself. Now, if we look at the scripture readings today, I think that each one of them in their own way says something about Calvary and how Calvary has been 
for some people in our community over the years. The first reading from the uh, second book of Kings, we have Naaman, the, the uh, Syrian warrior uh, who comes as a leper to Israel and you know gets mad because he has to deal with uh, a messenger rather than directly with Elisha. But anyway, we see that as the story progresses, that he does what Elisha says eventually, and he experiences a restoration of health. His skin disease goes away. It becomes like a young boy, it says in the text. And so he's just overjoyed. We don't see what else that reading says beyond where we read today, but he is so now taken by what God has done through the prophet in just this very simple way that was prescribed to him, washing seven times in the Jordan, that he wants to take a cartload of dirt back to Aram with him so that he can have a spot where he can always worship the God of Israel in thanksgiving for the healing that he experienced. Now, the reason for that is that they believed in that time that God, whichever God you worship was part of the whole territory. So in the ground, as it were. And so in order for him to have contact with the God of Israel, he needed to have some of the soil. So that's what he ends up doing. You know, there have been people who have come to this parish over the years. Some who've come and stayed, some who came for a short time and then moved on. They came here because they were seeking a place of healing, a place where they could belong, a place where they would feel at home and welcomed not only by God, but by the people of God. They came here because they had a falling out in the church or with the denomination where they were before, or they went through some big change in their life and they could no longer fit in that situation. Or they came here hurting because of something that was happening in their lives and by knowing someone from this congregation, they came here. They felt accepted, welcomed. They felt as if God was really going to be able to do something for them. And so their lives were touched, their lives were changed in the period of being here. They received a kind of healing, not from any elaborate thing that they had to do, but rather from the acceptance, the prayer, and the presence of God in this place and being touched by the Spirit of the Lord through the people of God who belong here, who worship here, who've made this their home before. And I think that that is something that we, on this consecration anniversary, should be very aware of, proud of, and thankful to God for. That, that God has brought about this kind of a place and an atmosphere where people can come and experience a healing of their hearts, a healing of their relationship with God. And sometimes, you know, a healing that, that affects their, their, whole, their whole being. And the second lesson is Paul trying to sum up to the Galatians what he's been uh, trying to say in the other chapters, and he's, he's very unhappy that the Galatians have been 
uh, descended upon by people who were trying to convince them that they needed to take on the Mosaic Law before they could be fully Christian, after Paul had taught them entirely something different, and some of their members had caved on that. But he tries to stress that what matters is the cross of Christ, nothing else, not circumcision or non-circumcision, but only the cross of Christ is what ultimately matters, will ultimately give the peace of mind and heart and soul that they have been questing for and that they have now received because they've come to Christ, they've been baptized into Christ, they have received the gift of the Holy Spirit, and now they've been made new. And so they ought to rejoice in that newness and give praise and thanks to God always because of what he's done for them in Christ. And our parish has served in that way all these many years that people who are here today, you all who are here, in some way or other have been touched by the grace of the Lord that here you come to meet Christ present in his word, in one another who believe, in the Holy Eucharist, and that you're strengthened by your gathering here, by worshiping together, sharing our faith together, spending time together, sharing a life together, that makes it possible for us the other six days of the week to live out this faith, to be a sign to the world around us that we don't have to do anything extraordinary in order to be faithful to our Lord and in order to share the love that God gives to us in Christ in this place week by week. And then the gospel itself. You know, Jesus sends the 70 out to prepare the way before him. Then Luke is the only one that tells the story. It's reminiscent of the 70 that Moses was told to call from the people who would work with him, who would help him to serve the people who were always coming to Moses with another issue and that Moses was supposed to deal with, plus lead the people and everything else. So these 70 are chosen by Jesus and sent forth to prepare his way, to get them ready to hear what he had to say when he came. And then as we hear in the gospel today, they're overjoyed when they come back because it's been such a tremendous success and they've even been able to to see people being freed from the, the domination of the evil one, of the demons. You know, we saw, we, even the demons are subject to us, they say. And then Jesus recounts his experience of seeing Satan kicked out of heaven, and, and then he tells them, don't be so happy that the demons are subject to you but be happy, be glad, and rejoice that your names are written in heaven. And that's for all of us who are here today, and those who have been and who are a part of the parish, to remember that we are not only here to receive, but we are to be fortified by being here in order to give that wherever we go, we go to prepare the way of the Lord into the life of somebody else. And we do that not by preaching, but by sharing our faith, and even more by living it, just giving a demonstration that our faith makes a difference in how we speak to other people, and how we speak about other people, and how we talk about the world and what's going on in it. Those are some of the ways that we as Calvary 
who live out this call and gift that has been ours all of these years since 1855, really, and how it needs, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> in these 138 years, we have proclaimed, celebrated, welcomed people in, and then been sent forth to live the gospel every day from this place. And so that's why we do well to celebrate the anniversary of the consecration of the church. Because God gave us this church through the generosity of John Van Norwick and his family. And God has continued to bless this place with generous people like yourselves whose gifts both monetary and physical, have done so much to maintain it, to embellish it, to make it a beautiful place in which we can be still and know that God is God, and where we can also sing and pray and receive the sacraments and just be touched by the grace of the one who inhabits this place who gathers us week by week to be in his holy presence and whom we worship and adore, whom we petition for all of our needs and who hears us and grants us what is most needed by all of us who are here and those that we pray for who are either close by or far away. And so we can be ever grateful for the generosity of those who's who have made it possible for us to have this place, for the generosity of those whose participation and generosity over the years has maintained it and continues to maintain it so that it can be a center of healing, a center for encounter with God, and a center for mission to be sent forth to carry the good news, the love of God in Christ, and his healing presence to others around us.